Next we have Jeff Martin. Jeff is a PhD candidate in geography, currently writing up dissertation research on wolf livestock conflict and coexistence efforts in central Idaho. Their background is in political ecology and economic geography, but they're also deeply interest in, interested in more than human engagements, speculative fiction, and questions of world building. Jeff's talk is titled, World Building and Storytelling Between Ethnography and Speculative Fictions. Cool, all right. Uh, well, thank you for having me as part of today's symposium. Um, We've heard some really interesting uh, interpretations of this earth writing theme, and I'm excited to add my own thoughts to this conversation, though I admit um, my work that I'm gonna present here is feeling a little bit out of place among these fine talks, but bear with me. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate, as Shard, as Shard said, here in Berkeley Geography. I'm writing up my dissertation research on wolf livestock conflict and coexistence mm -hmm. and public lands management issues in central Idaho. Uh, my academic grounding is kind of largely in political ecology, economic geography, and environmental governance, but I also dabble uh, in more sort of esoteric social theory and the humanities and questions of animals and more than human. Um, what I'm going to talk to talk about today is a bit of a tangent from that work um, and sort of cross pollinates with some of my other identities and passions. Um, I'm a geek. I enjoy uh, speculative fiction. I have drawn monsters in fantastic worlds since I was a child, and I run tabletop role-playing games in what spare time I have, like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, some of this interest has started to leak uh, into my academic work, including a special issue I'm currently co-editing around critical world building. Um, so today I'll talk through a little bit on possible conversations I've been thinking about between ethnographic writing, story and storytelling, role-playing and speculative fiction. It's very much a first pass at thinking some of these things aloud, um, so I do encourage your suggestions and critiques later, um, if, especially if you've thought along these lines as well. So, uh, to start, I wanna flag this concept of world building. Mm -hmm. As it's used today, world building is usually describes the process of constructing an imaginary or fictional world or universe, generally for purposes of speculative fiction, in novels, films, games or for its own sake. Um, today this work, which can include imagined cartographies, ecology, cultures, languages, pantheons, and even physics, um, increasingly contributes to both popular culture and big business. So think of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, etc. Uh, this work is also pursued by many as passion projects. Um, I will admit to being part of that. Uh, things that will never see print in any real way. Um, do check out the subreddit Our World Building if you want to get a sense of the <laughs> community of folks that's really grown up around this type of work, especially since the 2000s. So while I've yet to do a full genealogical exploration, um, I have found a few interesting points. I'm not sure how well you can read that. Um, in the 1800s, world building is used primarily to describe scientists' attempt to explain geologic formations, yeah. so the creation or emergence of landscape features in a very earth sciences, geography adjacent kind of way. And some of these quotes here attest to that. Um, by the 1820s, it first begins to take on a meaning surrounding consideration of hypothetical other worlds or universes with different physical laws. So the Edinburgh Review in 1820, um, and a century later in Eddington's Space, Time, and Gravitation. And then beginning in the late 19th century, late 19th century, excuse me, um, world building is used to describe the realm of novelists and poets and sort of the creative side of this. So from these, the contemporary usage emerges beginning around the 1960s in discussions of science fiction and fantasy criticism. So this is the era of Tolkien, you might note. There's Middle Earth right there. Um, but in general, these linkages, I'd argue, provide a jumping off point for thinking uh, together and across these diverse realms and disciplines. So changing gears a little bit, um, ethnography, the anthropological study and representation of a culture or society, something many of you in this room are no doubt, of course, familiar with. Um, but when we think about doing ethnography, we think of thick description, a sense of place, and an in-depth relating of the people and relations involved. As with geography and the play we're making of, with the title of the symposium, the concept of ethnography, of course, contains within it the idea of writing. And I will argue that there are a great many parallels, really, between ethnography as academic practice and fiction writing. 
And did we see setting, characters, and to the extent we as authors tell a particular story, plot. So both fiction and ethnography attempt to situate us in a particular context, to bring the reader along uh, with the researcher or author on a journey and experience of a place and its history. There's a kinship here, I think, that bears some thinking about, uh, including both the tactics and techniques used in each form and towards what ends those are put. So I thought a bit about how ethnographic thick description might draw on my own experience and efforts running a role-playing game and vice versa. Um, when we talk about tabletop role-playing, we use the concept of the theater of the mind, a term with origins in radio plays like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, seen here, to think about how we communicate a shared imaginary to audiences without visual representation. Um, in forums and books around game mastering and novel writing, you'll see reference to sensory detail, questions of what is included or left out in description and to what effect, and the creation of atmosphere and affect through creative choices of narration. There's not really a big aha here. Um, also, that's not me, although it very easily could be me. Um, but I want to flag the value of thinking across <coughs> disciplines and traditions as we think about telling stories. Um, in both forms of storytelling here, fictional and ethnographic, we hope to immerse readers in a place they've not been and, in fact, may not physically exist. So I've also been increasingly thinking about the role of story, narrative, and even myth in both my research and broader politics. Um, wolves, sheep, and the American West, which is sort of the bulk of my research, are these over-mythologized things, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, in Idaho, a few narratives show up a lot in conversation, seen here, or maybe not for those in the back. We've got Canadian wolves, wolves in rivers, and hoofed locusts, referring to sheep. Um, these stories straddle the line between fiction and fact, if that's even a useful distinction. In the telling, they're usually based on anecdotes, often a degree or two removed. So, my uncle's friend saw this thing. Um, or grounded in a particular place or site. Another person may make uh, the opposing argument or tell a contradicting story based in their own experiences and anecdotes, and both stories can be at least partially true. These stories then act as theories or models of the world, um, in that they imply certain sets of relations and provide a guide to action or justification of certain policies or practices. So for instance, setting up wolves as Canadian makes them into foreign invaders that do not belong on these landscapes and should therefore be removed. Um, these stories also play a similar role to folklore and myth, in that they produce community identity and lessons for behavior. So, I'm grappling with how these narratives, as a sort of lay and localized knowledge or theory, um, do work in the world, for the people telling them, for the audiences they're told to, and for us as researchers. One thing I've been toying with is how these stories, um, and even seemingly magical thinking, uh, might be ways for individuals and groups to navigate complex systems and effects outside their control. A sort of assertion and understanding of power, and I'm thinking about some of the anthrop anthropological work on magic. Um, I'd be curious to know if others have thought of along these lines. Um, more importantly, however, um, I'm thinking about stories in our current era. Um, the era of post-truth, fake news, and a too frequent rejection of science and expertise and how we might then tackle problematic political narratives more broadly, especially when the presentation of counter-evidence is largely ineffective. And the wolf conflict is a great example of this. Um, my tentative thought is that we combat stories with other, better stories, uh, alternative political narratives that relate experiences in different ways and towards different ends. I think this is a broader conversation, of course, but I'd love to get into some of it later. So, thinking about better stories, um, I want to bring us back to speculative fiction. Um, science fiction and its cousins have long opened up spaces for thinking about alternatives, uh, both good and bad. Dystopias often follow a trend to its extreme as a sort of warning, while ut utopias suggest how the world might be better. So think of the post-scarcity societies presented in Star Trek, for instance. Um, while writing, al writing alternative worlds is a form of experimentation, then, something that tries to push us beyond the bounds of our own context and subjectivity. This can include relating to the other, often a very alien, non-human other, and scholars from animal studies to post-colonial and feminist theory have explored the potential of speculative fiction towards these ends, to challenge conventional thinking and dominant narratives, 
and to build new forms of empathy and understanding. I also pl have played about around a bit with role playing and teaching as a sort of ped pedagogical tool uh, for these same reasons. Um, and that's another conversation I'd love to have. Uh, you good? Oh, lost it. Well, I'll keep talking. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, stories make political claims, at least implicit. To borrow from political ecology, there's no apolitical media. Um, but I think, so I'm not saying you can't enjoy whatever fictional worlds you do, um, but I am saying that I think it's important to be aware of and critically engage fictional worlds. So Westworld, The Handmaid's Tale, hell, Harry Potter. Uh, these are texts that we can and should analyze and critique because they're our own times mythologies in many ways, and they reproduce per particular political understandings in our own world. Um, the internet is, of course, full of political debates around these texts, but I'd argue that critical scholars have so both something to add and a stake in these discussions. Um, so authorship and creation of fictional worlds, to paraphrase Donna Haraway, comes from somewhere. Particular contexts and positionalities with their own strengths and biases. So Tolkien, a linguist and veteran of World War I, brought his experiences to Middle Earth in the languages that he created and his not so vague Eurocentric and Orientalist presentations of the men of the West versus other peoples or Easterlings. Um, Tolkien was also not a political economist and much of how Middle Earth kind of works is hand-waved painfully, but that's my own <laughs> bias and interest. Um, Frank Herbert writes Dune in the 1960s, and it's hard not to see tones similar to those of Silent Spring in his engagement with ecology at the planetary scale. So this partiality of authorship, I think, also points in similar directions to conversations across speculative fiction and academia about representation. Which stories get told or funded? Which voices are heard? Which faces are seen? Storytelling of the sort I've been describing has too long been dominated by people that look a lot like me. White, male, cisgender presenting. Um, I'm not saying we should take that away. Those stories can certainly still be valuable. But we also need stories of different kinds, told by different kinds of people from different contexts and perspectives. Because of speculative fiction, political narrative, etc., are ways we might as a society navigate and grapple with an unknown future, then we're stronger with more voices, more experiments. Science and culture are collective projects, and if stories are tools for understanding and acting in the world, a diversity of voices adds to our own adaptation and resilience, to use some questionable terms, but also to building better futures. So one reason I like running role-playing games, and academia at its best, is that because as much as both world-building and my dissertation, uh, both large projects, uh, are individualized, um, the work is also a collaborative and collective effort. Uh, meaning and significance only comes through dialogue and relation between researcher and informant, author and reader, as we co-produce our worlds. Thank you.